very warm welcome to this video. It is the 18th of November in 2022, and we are in Amman in Jordan. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Walid Sarhan. He is, many people here in Jordan call him the godfather of psychiatry and psychology. He has founded many, many, many first things. So I would like to invite you now to join me in listening to his life stories. He has told me many of his stories and I'm absolutely amazed and blown away by, by you know, and I think we can all, all learn from his courage and wisdom. My name is Evelyn Lindner. I am the founding president of a global dignity network. So now I would like to start with the first question to you, dear Wahid, or do you want to say something in between? You know what I would like to thank you for this opportunity to meet and to uh, talk about uh, my experience, hoping that uh, some people somewhere may benefit from it. Wonderful. So here is my uh, first question. I have noticed that people in the streets here in Amman, they know you much you know, as much as the colleagues at the university and in hospitals. So how come, how can you explain what brought you to such a level of visibility in all, at all levels? Oh, well, that is, uh, uh, that is my life story, actually. Uh, I uh, came back from training in 1985, from, back from UK. And uh, I started from day one writing in the th major three local newspapers daily and talking on radio and television. And gradually I have my own program on television and radio. And later I have been appearing in the media nonstop all these years. Uh, then when the social media came, I also became uh, active on that. So people in Jordan and the Middle East, even North Africa, would always uh, recognize me and say hi and so on. And uh, it's it's actually a part of my mission coming back from UK, I thought that uh, psychiatry in this part of the world is not yet well established. And to make it more clear and established, I wanted people to know what does it mean? What is psychiatry? What is mental illness? Uh, uh, how can they deal with it, uh, when they need to see a doctor, what is therapy, what is medication. And I have moments uh, in, in these uh, programs, many, many moments, with when I actually uh, would say something like, uh, and uh, on, on TV in the night about panic disorder, and next morning, I, I and this was one of the ma major stories. A lady came in from a peripheral area, and she said, "I have this disorder you described, and uh, this disorder." is affecting me for the last 16 years since I gave birth. And every night they take me to that emergency, they give me injection and I come back. Nobody ever told me that, that there is something wrong. Uh, 
last night I realized that I have this uh, disorder. So please help me. I did. Actually, in a few weeks, she was much better. And she came with her uh, 16 years old son. The son she gave birth to before this panic started. And she was crying in tears, saying to me, you know, doctor, I have just known my son. I haven't seen him in the 16 years. I was either sleeping or in hospital uh, or in, in panic. And I don't know how he grew up. I, I, I now I can say I will enjoy looking after him and so on. Such stories and daily practice make it uh, make it one uh, determine that there are definitely so many people like this. One day in Benghazi in Libya. I was giving some lectures in the hospital, and one of the doctors there said that to me, this lady insisted to say hello. She is uh, coming from uh, 3,000 kilometers in the desert just to see, to, to see you. I said, what, what's, the, what's behind that? He said she is living in the desert in the tents and she has a TV. She heard you talking about autism and she came to me to say that I have a child who has autism in literate between women. And I know that it has no cure, but I need help. And uh, she, in her last visit, he told her that uh, your doctor who discovered this is coming to visit us. And she knew the date and insisted to come. Uh, things like this is, is not a uh, minor incident to me. There are the calls for more. There are calls for more that what I do is not enough. I have to, to do more and more. And uh, I have audience in Algeria and Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and Sudan and all the Gulf area, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, so on. So this sort of interaction with the public has made a huge big difference on uh, this visibility you have noticed. And uh, this visibility uh, has become actually part of my life. Yeah, just uh, mind blowing. You know, I remember from my doctoral research in Somalia in the villages I sometimes entered houses where uh, a schizophrenic member of the family was chained in iron chains yeah. in one room and uh, or dement older people were chained in rooms uh, like animals. And uh, at that time, and this is many, many years ago, and I hope that the situation and I trust that the situation also in Somalia has changed. But I know that this has been, uh, you know, a, a, a big need for for more clarity of what is what. So it, what is uh, something that can be treated and what can be um, kind of held in the family? And so what is what? And you explain that. So my next question. And I I. I hear that everybody calls you Dr. Walid, yes. Dr. Walid, Dr. Walid, and I'm very, very, very honored that you allow me to say Walid to you. So I say Walid to you. <laughs> and 
I recall a story that you told me about the pleasure of failure. Yes. I think that this is a very important way of thinking that can be useful for many people. So could you perhaps relate this story to us? Well, it's uh, actually when I came back and I was very enthusiastic, there would be always uh, things happening or uh, conferences and meeting. And I felt that uh, my senior colleagues were always talking in a desperate and uh, frustrated manner. Like, uh, let us revive the Arab Federation, let us do this, let us do that. And uh, they end up that it, this is impossible. So I started uh, first time in 85 by saying, uh, let us uh, do a conference for the Pan-Arab uh, Conference on Psychiatry in Jordan. And uh, they said, they said to me, well, uh, you are only few and you have never had any experience. How could you do it? It's impossible. Said, and you well, were very young also, huh? Oh, yes. I um, was, um, let's say, 32. And uh, I said, well, let, let me try, and I will have the pleasure of failure. That's a uh, pleasure and honor of failure. I said, well, you want to fail, go ahead. So we did that, we did the conference in 87. And in 87, I said, we well, need to have a scientific journal, our Arab Journal of Psychiatry. And they said, oh, well, that's, that's too big. That's very big challenge. It's uh, beyond our ability. I said, well, I also would like to have the honor of failure and I would be pleased if you give me this task. And they said, go ahead. And I established the Arab Journal in 89. Later on, it was the Arab Board. It was the first psychiatric hospital. It was uh, now probably the second psychiatric hospital. And so many things uh, like that that people usually are scared to try because they could fail. And I personally think that trying and failing is an honor. Yeah, but not trying and just sitting there afraid of failure, yeah, that's a shame. So I would uh, be always ready for you try it for to, to ch any challenge, even if there is a high chance of failure, I would say I will take the honor of failure. And I think that has contributed to my scientific academic uh, position in the Arab world. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. And, you know, I, I asked you and I always wondered, you know, how on earth uh, did you become like that? And you said, said that you were already as a child, very special. So I would love to know in what way you were special as a child. Well, I, as far as I can remember in my childhood, I would have always been just reading writing, going to libraries. Okay, I would um, participate a little bit with other children in any activity, but my target is go, going from one library to another. And uh, that became part of my character, that uh, even if I'm sitting and studying, there will be two books in my hand, one for the school and one for not for school. And when I want to have a break, I leave the school book and go to the other book. 
and that would be a nice break and then I'll come back. So in a sense that, uh, I, but I was probably insightful enough not to make that isolating me from my peers. So I would always uh, interact with them, even if I don't feel this is uh, something great and I could go and read. I used to insist on some participation in every activity. And that went on all my school, university, and postgraduate life. Yet I have been uh, reading and reading and reading and reading nonstop. And uh, so somehow that distinguished me from my colleagues in every uh, step of my life. And this, uh, uh, this is continuous until this day that I have to read, give lectures, um, uh, write papers, evaluate papers, uh, and uh, apart from doing my duty and seeing uh, the patients and so on. So it has been like this all my life. Actually, I have not lived any other life. So I actually, I don't know what people mean by the other kind of life. I can understand it, I see it, but I would prefer my own style and I and that would be something I enjoy and I feel I serve uh, people and serve uh, humanity in general. Yes, and uh, I remember when I first met you, you explained to me how many books you read in a week or uh, that already when you have uh, had your breakfast, you have already heard the first podcast or something. And in the car, you have your audio books. And uh, I was amazed. Yeah, I have uh, always audio books uh, running in any time in the car in the morning. Uh, this is uh, today, uh, probably I have listened something like four or five hours already and uh, read so many other things. I went to the hospital, so the patients uh, have people coming for lunch and interacted with them and the children. And then I go back to my little corner and uh, go on with this uh, uh, schedule that is that has no days off and no no breaks, uh, no Fridays or weekend or anything. I remember you told me that once a colleague uh, came to a conference said, I will stay one day more day and want to spend one day with you. And after that day, he, he said, what you do in one, and he came with you, he accompanied mm. you during the day. And he said uh, after that, what you do in one day, other people do in, in 10 days. Yeah, true. That is uh, one uh, friend from London, and he insisted on spending the full day with me from seven o'clock in the morning until midnight. And he, uh, he couldn't uh, believe the number of things I have done, the number of patients I have seen, and that uh, he was saying I would, the maximum in one day I would see six patients and that would be five days a week. You are seeing uh, tens of patients every day, all days, uh, yeah, with the exception of Friday, but even on Friday, you go to hospitals, you do see emergencies and so on. So you actually don't have a real weekend or a holiday. Yeah, uh, which is true. And it's, uh, of course, some people would say, well, this is stupid. You need to go and live and so on. 
I actually enjoy it. And I, I have been to many, many conferences around the world. I would attend a conference and meet people and get to know more, many, many friends through that. But also I step out of the conference and go and see the city and see the museum and go around, uh, see the attractions in that part, the history, the society, the uh, habits, the traditions and the culture. So I wouldn't say that uh, in my life is exclusively uh, psychology and psychiatry. It has uh, many other things. And when I, the things I read are not necessarily all uh, related to the, my profession. I would be reading history, memoir, uh, yeah, novels at times, uh, uh, so many things. Uh, I would say probably any any odd to biography appears. Uh, I I would be probably the first one to to start reading this. I like uh, reading autobiographies. I read so many. So that's uh, that's how. Uh, how li life is enjoyable to me. I hear a lot of criticism that you don't take time off, that you are always busy. Uh, but people who knows me, who are close to me, know that this is the, my pleasure. And if uh, my family notice that I am not reading and not doing anything, they immediately know I am sick, that uh, it's not a good news if, if I am not doing anything. Uh, like when in the lockdown, people were all bored and couldn't, uh, the, the, how to, can we spend the time? It was for me and a simple task I would I was translating a, a big book, a reference book, Oxford textbook of psychiatry from English to Arabic. And I would spend 16, 18 hours daily translating in this book, this book during the lockdown. After I do the round and see patients, I come back and continue translation until midnight. So uh, I, I think this is, better way to uh, spend the time than just sitting there angry and annoyed because there is lockdown and or there is any 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 reason not making you not able to do what you want so to be, for me there is uh, the word boredom i don't like and even my children knew that the word boredom should not exist. The word, are, which word, which word? Boredom. I am bored. I am. Oh, bored. boredom. Yes. Yeah. yeah. As yes. Uh, you, if you can read, then why should you be bored? Right. Yeah. That's that's simple. And I benefited very much, you know, because uh, when we first met, I sent you the text about my father and uh, how my life somehow grew out of the traumatic experiences of my father in war and displacement. And, uh, you know, this is about 10, 10 pages of text and quite heavy. And um, I think few people really want to read through it. It's also not, not easy read. And of course, you know, I benefited from your ability to read everything. So you read it and you understood. You had such a deep, deep understanding. Uh, which really um, touched me deeply and made me very, very uh, glad. Uh, such a such a deep understanding. So this uh, it's 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 not the amount that you just read a lot. You also understand deeply. Yeah. Thank you for this observation. Yes. So my next question to you. Uh, you know, you are what is in literature described a gifted child. You were a gifted child. 
-hmm. you were different from other children, you were a gifted child. So um, what would you advise parents to do who have particularly gifted children? What is the best way to nurture them and help them flourish? Well, the best way is first to realize that these children are different, they have the special abilities, and they, these abilities uh, uh, distinguish them from other children. So the rules that are applicable for every child may not be suitable for them. And that uh, they have to find out what these rules for gifted children. And in many cases, as you know, in special education, yes, we do have special education for those who have intellectual disability, but also you do have special education for who are gifted children because uh, they get bored easily in school. The school work is not enough to fulfill their uh, time and need. And so parents should be, should be aware and try to help. And if they cannot, they should consult uh, somebody to, to uh, help them uh, give this child the full potential of his ability and not insisting on him doing things the way they th they want. Yes, they are their, his, his, the parents, but they are not gifted. And they, these children uh, will not follow the simple uh, routine things. And you cannot tell a gifted child, go and study, do home, uh, or homework or whatever. Uh, this, is, uh, this is on a side issue for him. He would do all the schoolwork and still have uh, enough energy and time to do many other things. And uh, many gifted children in the world are disabled by their parents and the school and the society and uh, will never ever be able to reach their uh, full potential capacity because of this hurdle. So uh, definitely any big parents who notice that their child is different is not just something to talk about and be proud of. It's, it's a very tactful issue and need special care. And if you cannot uh, handle it, uh, you need to ask people who have uh, experts, uh, are experts in dealing with gifted children. Thank you very much. Very, very important. Now comes my next question. We have talked a lot about the medical system and you have explained your views. I recall that you had many ideas as to how health services could be better organized. Well, that's a very important question. And I would say, uh, uh, the International Monetary uh, Fund and Bank and their, and their repeated visits to Jordan and many other countries. In one meeting, I was meeting with them and they were trying to convince the government that government uh, are unable to provide full uh, health service and they should buy the services from the private sector for the citizen, which would be much, much cheaper than running it by a government. And the government will only take the primary care in their in, in its uh, service. I think this uh, initiative, uh, I, even in, in many countries in Germany, uh, the government doesn't build that hospital. The, the hospital is built and the government can, will have a contract with this uh, hospital, treat patients uh, insured by the government and the government will pay. You know, and that be, 
usually one will mean one tenth of the cost. The cost in a private hospital for any procedure that costs, say, $100. Uh, if you do it in a state hospital, it will be 1000 or 2000 So you can do much better service if you, you are ready to take uh, the experts' uh, adv adv advice to uh, make sure that the service, health service provided by the government, like vaccination, antenatal care, primary care health, that could be easily run, but not hospital service. And this is actually still a problem in many developed, uh, developing countries around the world, uh, struggling with their health service. Pay, they pay, pay a good sum of money from their little budget, but they are not getting a uh, good service out of that. Although in the same amount of money, you will get much better service if they buy the service uh, from the private sector. Uh, some people would uh, they say, well, this is, it means you are preventing government from uh, providing uh, its duty. I'm not. I'm saying it's they should not build and run the hospital, and uh, but they buy the service and they there could be competition. Uh, I want this super procedure to be done, and the hospitals have to uh, compete to get this this offer from the government. So in other words, the uh, government will buy the citizen the best health service available for the negotiated price, which is any price provided will be much less than the uh, money the government could be pay for the same service if it is running the hospital. I remember at some point you uh, said to me that you thought that uh, health services should be um publicly, uh, that, that it should be a, a public um, cost or publicly covered. Perhaps I don't remember that clearly enough what you said. Do you yeah, remember I mean, that? Yes, because what's happening in the third world now, that because the government's uh, health service is poor, people have to go to uh, private services and pay it from their pocket. And this paying from your pocket makes it makes life and Ill, difficult and illness more difficult that if you are sick you have the choice either to go to a poor governmental hospital or to go a good private hospital if you have the cost if you don't then you are deprived from this and may you end up going to a government hospital this is happening in many, many countries around the world. And it's uh, it's sad because there are solutions and I I, I I'm, I'm cannot understand why government don't just do it. And uh, usually there is protest uh, in the street, in the media about any move like this because people don't understand it. If you explain it to the people that yes, this uh, government hospital will be closed and or the government will withdraw and give it to somebody to run it and send, sell the service for the government. Uh, what's wrong with that? But then the what you said was then that everybody should have an insurance or what uh, I might not yes. remember correctly. Yes, well, in that in that case, the government should have provide insurance in these good hospitals. Now the insurance available in most countries for the government hospitals, which are not up to, up to the standard. But if you, they uh, have services up to the standard and they provide insurance and people 
but this government insurance can go and be treated in any good hospital around, uh, then uh, the government is paying for that. But the government will end up paying less than what they pay now for the poor services. I understand. So what is from your point of view then the reason for that in the United States, the health services are much more privatized than, for example, in Germany, and that the cost for the health service or the health sector is much, much higher in the United States and the level of health uh, much lower than in Europe. True, that's, that's the sad story because the government uh, has nothing to do with it. You have always private insurance and the private insurance is is very costly and not subsidized by the government so you there are some government services in different states in the in the united states but they are poor and the people wouldn't use them except if they are homeless or something like that so they end up uh, paying a lot of uh, money for insurance company to be able to reach these good uh, centers. Uh, that's why the example of the United States is is uh, is not the example I am uh, looking uh, uh, for. The example of UK and the National Health Service also has been criticized and uh, still until now everybody is insured and uh, yeah, even if you are visiting uk once you touch the land you are insured that's great but what's happening now uh, and for the last 30 years that uh, the waiting list is so long that people die in the waiting list and you want an appointment to see any any physician apart from your family doctor that means you will wait six eight nine months to have an appointment and uh, but if you look at other european countries that have adopted this uh, strategy of buying services from the private sector example for that is germany is they have a much better uh, health service, better even than UK and better than USA. And why is it better than USA in Germany? Would you explain? It's better because in Germany, the government will not build the hospital. The private sector will build the hospital or chain of hospital and have contract with the company to treat patients uh, who are insured by the government. And that means everybody will reach the best service, regardless of his income. And this is where I believe justice and dignity comes in, that uh, if you cannot find a proper place for your uh, health uh, care, uh, this is uh, against uh, any human rights, in my view. And so I would uh, rather go for the model of the government, have certain services to provide, but not the hospital services. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, when I finished the, uh, my medical studies, it's many years ago, and I... Uh, started you know be seeing the practice in the hospitals at that time they were in U germany they were not private but uh, government and at that time it was to me what really made it impossible for me to work there was that the patient was not in the center but the hierarchy and the requirements of the hospital like the university hospital uh, the, uh, not, uh, a certain amount of in, important uh, surgeries had to be performed 
So I saw an old woman who wanted to die at home, but she was kept because she had an interesting knee operation mm -hmm. and that uh, the, the hospital needed that operation. So the poor woman had to undergo that unnecessarily. And this is many years ago. So in that, at that point, it was not the profit motive that was uh, uh, at uh, the priority, but it was the, the kind of requirements of the hospital. And then after that, hospitals were privatized. And from my point of view, this made the situation worse, much worse. So I, I see the difference between Norway and, uh, and Germany. And I, um, I see that in Norway, it's, um, it's, a, it's handled a little bit uh, differently. And uh, it's a long discussion in what, and you know, as you know, I wrote a book in 2012, A Dignity Economy. Mm -hmm. How would, a, can a, an economy be um, envisioned for the future so that we humans can live on this planet in dignified ways uh, with each other and with our planet? And uh, there I'm thinking, you know, that even putting the profit motive at the top and Putting competition at the, at, as a priority, to my view, it does, it does not yet solve the situation. There must be one step more, but I wouldn't be able to to, um, to um, yeah, kind I, of spell I, out sure. that. Yeah, I'm sure the Norwegian, uh, or even the whole Scandinavian uh, uh, health service is more a balanced and uh, patient oriented than other parts of the world and it could this uh, policy makers could uh, look into such uh, uh, such places like uh, sweden norway and denmark and maybe learn a lesson from that uh, there is and learn a lesson from everywhere. Uh, this because developing health services, it's not uh, one person sitting in the office and just taking decisions. Exactly. It's a very so complicated you... story. And uh, you been in the medical field uh, and you know uh, the difference. This is a university hospital, and this is now, and this is a professor, and this is not a professor, and so on. This should all be tailored for to the benefit of the patient, exactly. to the benefit of the difficult case, not the interesting case, should go to the more senior and more expert. Uh, and this is where, uh, in the third world, uh, the uh, the rich person who is going to go to the best doctor and the best hospital. Uh, even if his problem is very simple and easy, uh, money is is the deciding factor, and that is uh, sad. It, if money is the only deciding factor, it means a majority of the population will right. not get the proper service. Exactly, and even in you know, as you know, I'm working with Linda Hartling and. Uh, she tells the stories how her even neighbors who would uh, be well off uh, now have to decide, should I get food or should I go to the doctor? You know? True. Yeah. I have seen people uh, saying that and uh, doing it. Yeah. Actually, uh, stop eating or eating very poorly to collect money because they need an, an operation. Yes, so here comes then a next question that is somewhat related. You said that when you meet young students and uh, young doctors, and they ask you, they ask you what kind of psychotherapy or therapeutical approach or school they should learn and they should enlist in. And usually it's a lot of money to train in such a school. And uh, you say you are, feel pity for them because they must be, you know, per definition, be confused because there are so many. Everyone seems to open a school. And uh, yes, perhaps you can explain a little bit yeah. what you told me. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that uh, 
people going to medical school, that is usually straightforward. But after medical school, you get your uh, specialty degree in, in whatever it is called, the board or a fellowship or whatever. And then you need to work in, in practice. And in psychiatry, uh, people, young psychiatrists are confused. Should they learn cognitive therapy or behavioral or cognitive behavior or dialectical behavioral therapy? And uh, they always imagine that one of these therapies should be the answer to everything and should be the best thing in life. And he should be the best therapist. I would uh, say to them, learn one good psychotherapy and do it well. Doesn't matter what, what it is. Doesn't matter who provided. But once you learn the first type of psychotherapy and you start treating patients, you start developing skills. And then you pick up things from here and there. And uh, once you are more senior, uh, you will have your own way of therapy. Unfortunately for the psychology students, it's it's more a sad story in in uh, the third world. Uh, psychology is not a, a discipline that uh, you know in many countries in this region. Uh, psychology department is part of the literature department or the literature college, and it's. Un, 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 unacceptable and uh, they finish their BA uh, assuming that the BA in psychology uh, will give them the ability to be psychotherapists and the BA in, 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 in psychology as you know it's an, in, it's an introduction to psychology it's not the exit it's an inlet yeah, so you from after this, you go on master, PhD, but you need also practical training. If you don't get into practical training and the sort of attachment to clinics and hospitals and so on, working with the team, mental health team, uh, you will never be able to be a good therapist. So what's happening, what's happening now that young students, the ones probably you saw with me in Jordan University, uh, they are active, enthusiastic, whether they are in BA or even master student. And the minute they finish, they think they are ready now to sit with patients and treat them, diagnose them, and they have never seen a patient in their life. Uh -huh. this, this is impossible. So the psychology is very much underdeveloped and it's uh, uh, people start spending money, taking course here and course there, assuming that how this is they become therapists. You never become a therapist and you are a therapist yourself and you know that quite well. Unless you see patients, you see patients in a team and group, and you see patients that you know they are schizophrenic or they, they are depressed or uh, they have anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. And you realize that this, uh, for example, in schizophrenia, without medication, you, you cannot do any therapy. And in bipolar disorder, without mood stabilizer, you are wasting the patient's life. So you know the limits and you know that uh, therapy, where should it be done to which person and at what time? And this, if you don't do this, you become harmful. You become a, a therapist who is just jumping in and doing things in the wrong way and ending up in, in a disaster which is uh, not, not really 
you the intention of of this student or this young psychologist so i i think in psychology we need a reform in this part of the world and people need to integrate psychology in now like everybody in the in the world that it is a neuroscience institute it's not a part of the literature department it's a science and science should be combined with other science with neurosciences psychology psychiatric nursing psychiatric social working all of this should go hand in hand and everybody learn from each other and uh, the th mental health professionals develop in this way so i hope that uh, young graduates know this and don't waste a lot of money and time in uh, taking courses and enroll enrolling themselves in and I know that some of the students are enrolled in four, three, four courses at the same time, and they pay thousands of, of, of dollars, and, uh, and they haven't actually been into any clinic or any hospital at all. So everything is on paper. Everything is in Zoom. They learn about uh, depression in Zoom. You cannot learn about any mental illness without sitting with patients and listening to them. I didn't know that this is so, so, you know, from my time. As you know, I'm, I'm affiliated with the university in Oslo. I have studied in Germany, uh, but my doctorate I did at the university in Oslo. And there they have uh, one, they have basically a, 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 almost a faculty uh, that has two parts. It has this professional part where psychologists are on a par with medical doctors and get this education that you are just uh, calling for. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they also preserve the other part, which is uh, one part is neuroscience, really. It's uh, studying the brain, uh, MRIs, and then uh, a more um, like a psychology and human rights. It's, uh, it's again, another part. So uh, psychology can have many, uh, many aspects, or the, the field of psychology has many aspects. And qualitative research in psychology, for example, is, again, Absolutely. something different. But so, what's happening here, the students think that any degree of psychology means clinical psychology. Right. Which is not, as you know, is not the case. There are no. at least 18 uh, types of psychology. And in their uh, undergraduate, they read just a bit of about everything. And it's it's not enough to, to no. call yourself in a, a side experimental Absolutely. psychologist or industrial psychologist or clinical psychologist that needs further programs the one you mentioned and many other successful program in the world and uh, even programs that offer the, the training that if you look into the website like you know, clinical psychology in uk there are two lines one is uh, clinical five years in hospital with a small thesis at the end and one is purely just thesis it has nothing to do with clinical work and that you take it for research and teaching purposes but it's not actually qualifying you to go and sit with patients and deal with them exactly so when I studied psychology in Germany, I uh, specialized in clinical psychology, and then I worked as a clinical psychologist, and I had this uh, practical uh, uh, training that you mentioned, and I did for many years uh, clinical psychology, and uh, first in Germany, and then for seven years in Cairo, in Egypt, and then I same, somehow uh, left clinical psychology behind and went from the micro level to the macro level. Yeah. I wrote my uh, medical doctorate in, uh, in medicine on the quality of life 
I interviewed people in Egypt and in Germany and asked them what is a good life. So this was already more on a macro level uh, or meso level at least. And then uh, in my um, PhD in social psychology, I uh, explored the uh, psychology of humiliation in rela relation to war and genocide. And this is then really transdisciplinary. It is uh, no longer only psychology. It touches upon many, many transdisciplinary fields. And uh, so basically in my personal uh, path, I, I went from, I'm a clinical professional cl clinical psychologist on one side, and then I went into social psychology, community psychology, and somehow I, I, I moved uh, to the macro level more. And even political science, uh, yeah, the psychology of political science is is mm. at the core of my work and of anthropology. And and uh, so um, mm, uh, many many people whom I met, uh, they 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 say, "Aha, you are a medical doctor and a psychologist, so you must be a psychiatrist." And yeah. uh, it is a long long story that I have to explain. No, I am not a psychiatrist. I am a clinical psychologist, and then I'm also a social psychologist. So it's a very complicated thing to understand for many people. Yeah. So now comes my next question. If you think of the mental health, not just of the people in Jordan and in this MENA region, but globally, what are your thoughts? We read in the media that depression is on the rise worldwide. I would love hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, depression, before being on the rise, in all the reports from the very world who developed uh, countries around the world, uh, you will find that 20 to 30 percent of patients with depression are being are under good regular treatment which is very sad so it is under treated worldwide this i'm talking about japan sweden uk uh, many of the excellent places around the world and uh, you can imagine that in the third world uh, this figure goes much much lower so we have to admit that uh, uh, mental illness is unrecognized and undertreated and depression in particular. There is uh, definitely evidence that there is has been increase in depression prevalence around the world uh, over the years uh, the, and specifically in the last uh, two years of COVID-19, the rise is, is very sharp. Uh, what are, why is that? We do have a lot of factors that are, are playing in the social disintegration and the social media replacing social cohesiveness and this, uh, the uh, abuse and use of all substances uh, starting from alcohol going to cannabis and synthetic drugs and um, opiates and so on and this uh, also uh, have added to the burden of the mental illness in general but have increased the prevalence of uh, depression and consequently increased the prevalence and the incidence of uh, uh, suicide and this is uh, in fact is recognized by the World Health Organization uh, years back when the World Health Organization predicted that in 2020 uh, depression will be the second most disabling disorder after cardiac uh, problems. Actually many parts of the world have reached the first the number one not number two and, and they exceeded the limit of uh, cardiac uh, this burden on the public and uh, by 2030 
the, the World Health Organization expect that depression will be the number one uh, disability, disability in the world. Uh, so I don't believe uh, this should be taken lightly uh, by government, by officials, by organization, uh, on the local, regional, and international level. A lot need to be done at the same ha hand, on the same hand. You know the growing elderly population in the West and how that is affecting health service and mental health service in particular with more and more demanding people around and demanding people create depressed caregivers. So it is a very uh, complicated, the scene of mental illness. And uh, I believe that more uh, attention is required for mental health worldwide. Uh, and this, uh, this is from this position here, I would call on everybody, and especially policy maker and decision takers, that please uh, put mental health as a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Such an important, important call. Very, very important. And uh, somehow, um, what would you? One one advice would be to strengthen the healthcare system, but would you also have uh, recommendations? How, as you said, it is uh, the uh, the the glue, the cohesion in society is getting less. Would you have uh, recommendations how this could be healed or prevented? Yes, you, you know uh, we are talking now about epidemic of loneliness. Yes. And this epidemic of loneliness uh, should have never started and should end. Uh, this uh, tradition in the West that people at the age of 18 leave home and leave their parents, their parents getting old, everybody is living alone. And if the family has two the parents with two, three children, everybody in different city and they may only meet on uh, Christmas uh, day or Eve, uh, which is uh, really sad. I, I think uh, a lot of attention should be given to changing such traditions and uh, going back to the family unit, being the unit of the build, building the society. As you know, this is in the Arab world, in many third power world countries, is still existing. And uh, it works beautifully in preventing mental health. And whether, whenever their mental health, there will be a lot of uh, support from the family and uh, society. The other thing that uh, uh, we have to talk about to stress it is the stigma of mental illness. I was saying that many, many patients who are known to have mental illness are not being treated, not just because of money or insurance, because of lack of, because of this stigma. And in uh, last February, I initiated the anti-stigma campaign in the Arab world because of this uh, part. Like anti-stigma campaign, I believe in the West, there is a need for uh, something very uh, clear, which is the, the point of anti uh, uh, loneliness campaign, anti-loneliness campaign that people have to get together, more community center, more social networking, keeping the families together. This is the most crucial challenge in the 
coming decades will be worldwide. Absolutely, I mean, so, so in resonance, it, this is at the core of my work also. I'm, I, in my last book, I describe how I was a clinical psychologist in Egypt many years ago and how I had uh, Western clients like I offered uh, treatment or, or counseling in uh, English, uh, French, German, and Norwegian. So expatriates came to me. And then I also had people from the traditional Egyptian population with the more I learned Egyptian Arabic. And uh, when people asked me, what is the difference? I said, in a nutshell, my Western patients or clients would, in the, if you, if you, cook it down to the core, the, the problem would be that they said, you know, if I die, who will come to my funeral? Who will cry? So this loneliness, already then, many years ago. And I said, you know, an Egyptian client would never, never, never get this idea. Of course, an Egyptian client comes out also to me because of problems, but these are very different problems. They are the problem connected that this collective, this extended family is a bit too oppressive. The hierarchy is a bit too oppressive. It's not caring enough, but there is at least this cohesion and the, the togetherness. So my conclusion in my book is that I say uh, the West uh, in trying to get away from this oppressive aspect has thrown out the baby with the bathwater. It's too far. If you want to uh, minimize the oppressive act, aspect in a collectivist system, then uh, co concentrate on that, but do not throw out the cohesion. So, uh, and many, I know people, you know, in the diaspora, in, uh, in, from the Arab world in, um, in the West, who, who do this bridge building. And I, in my life, as you know, did this bridge building between, uh, these worlds or these mindsets by by staying at the side of my father like in in germany you know where this was basically seen by many other people as very strange why do you you know stay day and night by your father you should he should be in a home alone and be visited uh, by the family perhaps but uh, every, every everybody should have his or her life. You should not sacrifice your life for your father. And I did. So this was exactly in the spirit that uh, that you describe now. And uh, it has been extremely, extremely enriching for me also. And I, I know also for him. So this is this is one aspect. And then the other other aspect that comes to mind for me is. Uh, I just read um, a master thesis. I had to grade it, and um, by um, a, Philippine, uh, a Sri Lankan student in Norway who studied Colombia, and uh, the, how psychologists in Colombia uh, accompany people who have, for example, suffered sexual abuse, accompany them to the court. And the notion of accompaniment, uh, I think, is is very good instead of of treatment, or mm, not for all, of course, when you have a, a, somebody who has schizophrenia, but you know, in, in cases of loneliness, it is perhaps not the, the right way to individualize and pathologize, pathologize the individual. It is to strengthen the individual. And uh, research shows that especially you know, when young uh, people are going through difficult times, it is enough when they have one person who treats, who listens to them and who, who, who has faith in, in them so that they can come out of the most difficult uh, life situation. So this accompaniment, I think, is, is a, an interesting and a very important um, task for the uh, psychosocial a services world uh, to uh, not to avoid pathologizing the individual uh, and and to rather look at the context and strengthen the individual and in the context in the difficult context. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, I, I, um, you know that I'm together with Linda Hartling, leading a global movement for dignity. 
I would love if you could tell us what you think their dignity is. How would you describe it or even define it? I, I understand it in my uh, way uh, that it's respect of human beings in all aspects of life. If we respect human beings in all aspects of life, then we there will be no humiliation, there will be dignity, there will be prosperous uh, world and society. Other than that, we will be going downhill. And now the next question. What would you say, what is humiliation? How do you understand that phenomenon? Well, unfortunately, I find in reading history, you will find that humiliation seems to be part of human history. And you were talking at the beginning about war. Uh, we are probably in the animal kingdom, the only race species that we fight for no reason. Animals fight to eat, but we fight for all sorts of reasons and many times for no clear reason. And the human history has shown that there are only 42 years, scattered years and through history when there was no recorded war. But on average, we do have uh, 60 to 70 wars going on at any one time, whether we hear about it or we don't. But these wars, most of them for unexplained reason. And uh, the humility and uh, human suffering mainly comes in in this uh, in this aggression of human being against fellow human being and i'm always wondering if this aggression and the humiliation is it part of human nature that is my usual uh, puzzle why should it be part of human nature or is it something we have invented through history? I don't know. Human beings have been around millions of years. How uh, we developed to be such an aggressive people, species that uh, is ready to kill for a reason or no reason, ready to fight, ready to humiliate, ready to torture i i cannot imagine the amount of torture that goes around the world and many times just because you are you had dif a different view or opinion uh, from the leadership is this a good enough to uh, humiliate and torture people let everybody have his own view and uh, we will never have the same view about anything. So humiliation seemed to be hand in hand in, in human history with the his going alongside development uh, of modern technology or whatever. And in fact, when you, I first heard about Dignity Group, that was a, a, like an electric shock. Uh, at last, there are some people who are uh, using the uh, other aspect of the coin and with other face of the coin and see the dignity instead of humiliation. I hope the movement of dignity will be able to minimize humiliation around the world, even if 10% that is achieving. Uh, so I am sure this is uh, uh, 
people could elaborate more on that, but I would uh, always go to the brief understanding of things and then build on it. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you know, I, um, I think I have to oblige you to read all my other books, especially my last book, Fear 450 Pages, but I think since you are such a good reader, it will be uh, it will be such an honor if you can read could read it yeah. because there um, I really uh, one of the basic questions that I have posed myself since decades is um, if it is human nature to humiliate each other and kill each other. If it's human nature, then we can just um, live with it uh, and we may destroy ourselves because now this uh, destructiveness is globalized and it's not just in one corner but it endangers all humanity so uh, it might it might then be suicidal for us um, but then you know I for decades I have uh, researched and explored and I come to the conclusion that it's not human nature and um, it is that human nature is relational and uh, that it depends on the larger ge geopolitical context. And in my book, I introduce uh, political science, international relations theory, the security dilemma. The security dilemma, dilemma has the motto, if you want peace, prepare for war. And this is a dilemma because it is aiming at peace, but creating war. So this is why the past 3% of human homo sapiens history are, as you said, almost always war and no lasting peace. It's not human nature that is guilty, you could say, it's this security dile dilemma that is guilty. And uh, if you love your people, you kill your enemy. It's the love for your own people that drives you. So basically it's not hatred and it, it may be even love that makes you kill. So, um, so this, I, uh, yeah, it's 450 pages. It will be such an honor if you could look at it and let I me will. know what you think. That will be wonderful. So my, my conclusion, and there my visit to Petra was uh, useful because I think that really the, uh, the, what is called the Neolithic revolution, which of course was not, not a one-time uh, event, but uh, over time, I think, it, it is the start of that, that before the Neolithic revolution, the first 97% of the history of Homo sapiens, we were socialized into small groups. The, there were not many people on this planet. And uh, so that this was a different frame. It was a win-win frame. And after the Neolithic revolution, it is a win-lose frame that is much, much more difficult. So I explain all that in this book and I look forward to uh, having your review of it. That will be lovely. I will. So now comes my next question, almost, almost last. If people want to um, listen to you, I, uh, you know, I think as, as you have included me into the WhatsApp group, uh, where you uh, communicate with your colleagues. I see that there are many, many, many of your colleagues, they ask you questions. They say, this pa patient uh, takes this medication and has these symptoms, and then uh, what, could it be that this is the reason? And you answer. It's a big, you, you're giving advice to everyone. So uh, if people are interested to be part of your universe, how can they do that? Well, they can visit my website and they can uh, follow me on all uh, social media and they can, uh, I have a Zoom uh, educational program that has been running since the beginning of COVID. It was uh, every Tuesday and Friday and now it's every Tuesday, Tuesday, 8 o'clock and my time. And there, there are that is uh, regular, and the program is full until June now. Uh, uh, it is eight in the morning or in the evening? It's eight, it's eight, eight in the evening. Okay. Yeah. I am uh, not the only lecturer. I am hosting this and inviting people to give talks. And if anybody apologizes at the last minute, 
I usually replace that person, but usually uh, we have senior colleagues uh, uh, present and uh, a lot of discussion take place. And this is a very good proof to be a very good, good platform where people can present uh, clinical problems, uh, ethical problems, and we will work together to help them. And this is in Arabic? Well, it's usually the presentation are in English, and but some of the discussion can be in Arabic. And then you have, so the, it is this uh, Zoom meeting and then uh, following on social media, do you have a blog or a podcast or something in that? I have a, have a YouTube channel and I there will be a podcast uh, coming up soon before the end of the year. Wonderful, wonderful. So now comes the very, very last question. You know, in, your, in our conferences, we always ask people to formulate a message to the world. And we ask everybody to um, think, what is the most important message the world needs to hear, given my experience and perspective on the world? What do you think is the most important thing the world needs to hear from your perspective and experience? Well, I actually have uh, two messages, one from the world leaders, and I would like uh, to ask them to look at the world as one big family, not me and they, we and they. This is not helpful. And for people, I would like them to take in, um, in mind to change the word globalization and this concept into humanization. If we move to humanization, then it's much more fruitful than sticking to globalization with its economic meaning only. That's my message. And uh, I hope it will reach somebody somewhere and uh, help to end the humiliation and improve dignity of a human being. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we are at the end, and I'm at the end of my questions, but uh, now please add what you would like to add. I really would like to add that uh, getting to know you and your organization uh, this year has been a very special experience. And I have already learned quite a lot from you and uh, this movement. And I hope uh, this movement will carry on and will have new blood and new generation uh, being active in uh, the dignity movement and uh, to be more widely spread around the world. And instead of thousands of people, I should be tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people joining in because this is one uh, organization that just target people and their uh, life without benefit, without, without any expectation for rewards or any, 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 anything, any material thing. So I would like to thank you very much. Yeah, as I call you, Evelyn, but uh, I end by saying Dr. Evelyn Gerda Lender, who is a very special person. Uh, I have learned quite a lot from you, from you, and I hope I will continue to learn. I hope I will continue to learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.